All right, so now that we have an understanding of the data requirements and the general process of doing uh, machine learning and supervised learning, um, we're going to look at how we can apply this in R uh, specific to the CARE package. So in this course, I'm going to introduce you to Random Forest Package and the Carrot Package um, throughout the, the remaining sections. Um, so, but Carrot is, is great because it can run a ton of different algorithms in a very common environment or syntax. So it's a great environment to do machine learning in R. So here I'm going to focus on that. Okay, so why would you use Carrot as opposed to the wide variety of other tools that are available to do this type of work? So uh, first off, it allows you to implement a variety of different algorithms using the same syntax. You don't have to learn different syntax for different algorithms. So for example, I could run four algorithms and just switch out a few, th few uh, lines and then get the results in a very similar way. Um, it also has tools built in to optimize the algorithm, which is actually really important in machine learning um, because um, there are hyperparameters that must be tuned and uh, that can be kind of time consuming and Carrot makes that easy. Um, and there are some pre-processing op options that are also made available. So things like centering and scaling data, principal component, transforming data variables. Um, it allows you to validate the model so there are tools built down to do va data validation like producing an error matrix. Again, it's really robust, it's a standardized method and it's creates pretty reproducible results. So I like Carrot. We're going to mainly, so that's why we're mainly using it in here. Uh, the, here's a link to the package. So this is the Carrot package. Um, here's a link, so that's the documentation for it. There are tons of different machine learning methods that are available in Carrot. Um, so here I'm going to show you k-nearest neighbor, decision trees, boosted decision trees, random forest, and support vector machines. But there are a lot of others. Um, so, for example, this link will if you can go if you go to this link you can uh, you can see a list of all the algorithms that are available. Um, note that if you're interested in things like deep learning, that's really not available in Carrot, partially because the way we do and and implement deep learning is a lot different than some of the traditional machine learning methods. So we're not really going to look at that in here, and again, Carrot wouldn't be appropriate for that. If you are interested in deep learning. Um, the environment most people work in in R or in Python is uh, Keras, which is kind of provides a high level of functionality on top of some um, deep libraries, so things like like TensorFlow, for example. So we're not really going to look at that in here. Um, I just wanted to note that that's really not applicable to Carrot. There are other options. Um, so if you're working outside the R environment, for example, if you're a Python, uh, if you work a lot in Python. The scikit-learn package within the Python environment is great. You can pretty much do all the same things you can do in R or Carrot there if you're more comfortable in Python. There's also Weka, which is a uh, which is this little Java-based software tool. I consider it more of a toy to just kind of play around with stuff, but um, maybe not a high-end development environment. So most people these days are working in R or working in Python to do their machine learning or deep learning. All right, so here's what the syntax looks like for training a model in Carrot. So uh, we're gonna we have this um, function called train, and then it you have a dependent variable, so the thing you're wanting to predict, and then you have a set of independent variables or predictor variables. You're going to grab this from some type of data set, so it could be like a, a read in vector file or a table. You're going to apply some type of algorithm to it. So in this case, we're applying our part, which is decision trees. We have some pre-processing defined. So we're going to center and scale all the variables. And then we define some controls for doing things like tuning. Um, so that's one method. So the key things I wanted to point out here was how you set up a call. So this class and then tilde period, what that means is predict class using all the other columns in the table. So that's just a shorthand for everything else. So if you had 100 other columns in the table other than a class column, then it's going to use those other all the 100 variables in the model. Um, the way I actually prefer to define a syntax for the model is this second method. 
So it's a little bit different. Note here we're not setting up a data argument. Instead, we're actually specifying columns from specific tables. And they can even be different tables as long as they're the same length and in the correct order. So we get the same function. Now we're saying y is equal to train. And remember, so this is the columns first. So that would be column one. So the first column is what we're going to try to predict from this table train. And then this, then we're going to use everything else in the table as the predictor variables. So two through the number of columns in train. Note that if you wanted to use a subset of the columns, then you could just you could create a list element there with like com uh, or a list a vector list using like combine um, to just call out the columns that you want. And then again, we're applying the same method, the same pre-processing, and the same uh, controls. So there's two different options. Uh, you're going to mainly see me using this syntax in here. Um, but there's also this formula-based syntax for defining the model you want to create. Input, pr a predictor, and uh, predictor variables, and um, in the dependent variable. Once you have a model, you're going to probably want to apply it to things once it's been validated. So um, making predictions is pretty easy. So this ob here's an example for predicting to a table object. So the model would be the trained model that the algorithm produced, and the new data would be a new data table. So for example, this could be your validation data. So once you've trained the model, you've, you apply it to the validation data, and you're going to get back predictions. So what you get back is going to depend on the type of model that you're creating. So if you are predicting a um, continuous variable, you could get a continuous measure. Um, if your probabilities, you get probabilities. Sometimes, or categories if you're doing categorical, and there's you know sometimes ancillary data that's provided along with just the the base prediction. Um, if you want to predict to a raster grid, that's fairly similar. So you can use the predict function, and this comes from the raster package. So you do raster underscore data. So that would be the grids. So like a stack of all your predictor variables as a grid. The model that you're you're using to make the prediction and then um, some other settings. So this progress equals window, that'll create a little progress window. Um, that's generally a good idea because if you have a large grid, these can be kind of slow, so you want to get a sense of whether it's progressing. Uh, overwrite equals true means it can overwrite the file on your computer. So I said that to true, so if I already had a predict.image file, whenever it ran this, it would overwrite it. So if you don't want to overwrite files, you could always set that to false to protect yourself. And this is the file name. Note here, I didn't put a full file path, because so it's just going to get saved to whatever the set working directory is. If you don't want it to save to the working directory, then you, you need to go in here and actually set a full file path. Um, I generally find that TIFF or image files work best for output, um, so I would stick with one of those in terms of like producing output. And as another side note, you may have a very large extent, and it might not be possible to actually read in all the data and, and predict um, to every location at once. So what you can do in those cases is grid or break the data up into smaller pieces and read them in as tiles. Um, and use some type of like for loop to loop through every single tile and write the output out. And then you could go into your your GIS or remote sensing software and um, actually uh, you know, merge them and process them if you wanted. Um, and another side note is, when you predict to a raster, the band names must also must match the the predictor variable names, so it knows what band or what raster layer is associated with each predictor variable. All right, so you also instead of getting a raster output, you may want to get a vector output. So one option for vector output would be things like write.csv, write.table, if you want to write to, to uh, you know, comma-separated values. You can also write to Excel file. Um, here's an example where you're writing the output to a database file using the write.database function from the form package. So again, you've seen this in prior sections. There's lots of different tools for exporting out a table of values. Note also that if you want to predict out, you can predict out to a SF type object and then save it to a um, to a vector polygon line point layer and as spatial data with the maintained spatial information. Or you could take the table that you produced and then associate it back to your spatial data using a join or something in your either in R or in your spatial um, software like ArcGIS. 
Okay, so that's the end of this section. So in the next section, I'm going to provide a kind of theoretical or conceptual understanding of some of the algorithms that we're going to, going to use before we get into some of the specifics of um, applying and working in this environment.